main focus of the uh, the recording. But uh, I did want to say that we're thrilled to have Deacon Jim Shanahan as our special guest today. Uh, he's going to be talking about the proposed tax law changes that are currently under review in Congress, um, but more importantly, the potential impacts that these changes could have on each and every one of us. Jim's also going to take the time to highlight uh, one of the Catholic Charities programs, uh, the Financial Stability Network. It's a program that he's very much involved in. Uh, it's a program that helps uh, Catholic Charities clients um, by us providing them with financial education and mentoring. Now, a little bit of a background about uh, Deacon Jim. He graduated from University of Notre Dame back in 1975. Uh, then he started off on a uh, nearly 40-year career as a tax professional, um, eventually at the firm Price Waterhouse Coopers, working initially in their LA office before eventually transferring uh, to the Washington National Tax Office in uh, 1982. He was ordained a deacon uh, in the following year, June of 2013, excuse me, in June of 2013, not the following year, but um, since then, since uh, his ordination as deacon, he's been assigned to Little Flower Parish in Bethesda, Maryland. After he retired from Price Waterhouse Coopers in 2014, uh, Deacon Jim came to Catholic Charities, where he started by working as a volunteer immigration lawyer uh, before becoming involved with the parish outreach program as a senior program manager. Uh, by 19, excuse me, by 2017, he took on another role. Uh, becoming the director of the Financial Stability Network. Jim's married. His wife and Mary Lynn have four sons, two daughters-in-law, and two grandchildren. Now, before um, I introduce, we introduce Jim and bring Jim on, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, a member of the board of directors, Elizabeth Mears. Uh, Father John, uh, who was initially uh, tapped to, uh, to be a part of this, is away on a well-deserved vacation. Uh, so I'd like to uh, ask Elizabeth uh, to share her uh, thanks and good wishes and uh, get the program running here. Elizabeth, uh, go ahead, take it away. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, Kevin said, I'm Elizabeth Mears. I'm a member of the Catholic Charities Board of Directors. And since Father John is away on a well-deserved vacation, I wanted to, um, on his behalf, uh, thank you for saying yes to the invitation to uh, this Good Samaritan Society webinar. As Kevin said, we're very grateful to those of you who have made bequests and lifetime gifts to Catholic Charities. Your previous gifts are still giving to support the agency to help us meet the challenges posed by the pandemic. Your legacy lives on in our daily work. For example, in fiscal year 2021, Catholic Charities provided more than 5.4 million meals to those in need, a 54% increase over the prior year. This past year, Catholic Charities served more than 252,000 men, women, and children through its extensive social service programs, such as the Financial Stability Network that Deacon Jim will describe for us shortly. Without that collective response from our generous community, we would not have been able to help so many people in need. It's a priority for the agency to educate people about the impact that gifts through their estate can have on our mission. Future gifts will enable the agency to continue its legacy of service by providing annual operating support and increased program resources. Thank you for your support and your participation in today's webinar. Elizabeth, thank you so very much. And thanks also to all of the members of the Catholic Charities uh, Board of Trustees, uh, Board of Directors. They provide us uh, with such great guidance and support. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do the great work that uh, Father John leads us on to without their assistance. So we're grateful to you, Elizabeth, and your colleagues. So today we're here to, uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, the potential uh, impact of the proposed tax law changes um, that could have on each and every one of us. You're also going to have the opportunity to learn more about the Financial Stability Network, um, just one of the many types of programs that Catholic Charities uh, 
provides its clients. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jim Shanahan. I'll uh, bring up his slides for us to be able to view. So um, in just a second, and we'll take it away, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. It's uh, a real honor and privilege uh, to join uh, you in your webinar today. And uh, again, we'll be getting to it in just a few minutes, but I want to thank you all for all your support in, in helping us launch uh, the Financial Stability Network. Uh, but what I've been asked to do uh, today is uh, present to you kind of an overview of, uh, of what's happening here in Washington, D.C., up on Capitol Hill with respect to the, uh, the so-called reconciliation bill. And what I'd like to do is kind of set the stage for you uh, about what's going on uh, in, from a tax uh, policy perspective. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's happening this week and uh, a little uh, uh, kind of outlook as to what may take place between now and Thanksgiving. And then we'll break for, for, for a Q&A. Uh, but let me just start by... Uh, describing you know, what, what, what is the Ways and Means Committee doing here? What's this reconciliation uh, bill all about? Well, this relates uh, to, to uh, President Biden's package, uh, his proposal to uh, create a, a Build Back Better program for the country. And uh, he's made, these are commitments made uh, through the course of his campaign. And uh, he wants to deliver on expanding Medicare, universal pre-K, climate change, making the, the child tax credit permanent. And uh, this package in total uh, is going to cost about $3.5 trillion. And uh, the Ways and Means Committee has the job of coming up with money to pay for it. And uh, they, on uh, September 15th, came up with a package to generate $2.2 trillion dollars, and that's a T, trillion dollars uh, over, over 10 years. Uh, this is the largest tax increase, probably going back to, to 1982, when I first arrived in Washington, when Congress had to come back with a huge tax increase package uh, to pay for uh, and cover a lot of the uh, costs associated with the Economic Recovery Tax Bill in, in 1981. This legislation I'll walk through uh, in parsing with a particular focus on, on the impact to you as individuals. Um, for the most part, the uh, provisions uh, would be effective uh, for tax years beginning after December 31st of this year. So again, these provisions will kick in if enacted in, in 2022. The other is that the president made a commitment uh, that any tax changes here would not affect uh, average Americans. And so the the income threshold uh, for these provisions, for the, as a general statement, kick in at, uh, at for individuals as uh, single taxpayers uh, with taxable income in excess excess of four hundred thousand dollars, and uh, for married filing jointly that would be four hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. What's not in this reconciliation uh, package that uh, I, I think many are, are, are hoping for and looking for is any relief with respect to the, um, the cap on uh, state and local taxes here, which for the Maryland and DC residents on the call here is a huge impact. And that was a change made a number of years ago. Um, the, the process is very fluid. Uh, and uh, I hope if anything to accomplish over this very short period of time I have with you is to encourage you to, uh, to, to, to stay close to this legislation, keep an eye on what's moving on, and, uh, and to sit down and talk to your advisors between now and the end of the year uh, to, to make any necessary planning in, um, in, this, uh, in this particular calendar year. So Kevin, why don't you move to the next slide, please? Let's talk for a minute about the key business proposals. Uh, and, uh, and again, I underscore the word key here because as you might imagine, in a package that raises $2.2 trillion, there's a lot in here. Uh, what's gotten most attention from the business perspective is uh, that the corporate tax rate would be increased from 21% to 26.5%. And again, that would be effective for tax years beginning after December 31st, 2021. What's really surprising about this is that uh, 
there's been talk about setting a global minimum tax out there at, at a much lower rate. And for Congress to think about raising the corporate tax rate more than five points is a little bit surprising there, but, but that's point number one. Point number two is that there was legislation enacted earlier that uh, would require um, that uh, R&D expenses be capitalized and then amortized over a period of time. And uh, this legislation would change that rule and would permit expensing R&D costs through 2026. Th this legislation also would accelerate to 2022 the, the start of, of new expanded limitations to the deduction of executive compensation. Uh, and this is for above $1 million for publicly traded corporations. And this would be to include the eight most highly compensated uh, officers. So this moves what would otherwise kick in in 2026 back to 2022. It also, um, would um, expand uh, the, the scope of the limit to compensation paid by other entities to covered employees. And then there is a um, section 199 cap A is a special deduction, a 20% deduction on qualified business income. And uh, they would set a cap here to owners of pass-through business entities. And, and that cap would be uh, set at $500,000 for Mary Fine jointly and $400,000 for individuals. And then finally, uh, on the international tax side, and, 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 and this could take an entire webinar in and of itself, is that there's gonna be a number of significant changes on the international side. And uh, these international changes will have a various effective dates that will significantly increase the cost and complexity of US businesses uh, uh, operating abroad and for foreign businesses operating here in the United States. What Congress is really concerned about is the continuation of erosion of the U.S. tax base. And what's uh, in this legislation right now would be an attempt to pull that back and have more income taxable here in the United States by preventing companies from moving income offshore to lower cost uh, uh, tax havens. So again, these are just the highlights of what's there from the business perspective. Kevin, if you could move to the next slide, please. So on the individual side, there's a lot here. And, and this is really what, what, what Kevin wanted me to, uh, to focus on. And again, keep in mind that these are all provisions in the, in the Ways and Means Committee package that was passed back on September 15th. All of these are subject to change, okay? And um, uh, we'll talk about that at, 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 uh, in just a few minutes. But what's in the reconciliation package, I'm kind of setting the stage right now. What's in play right now is as follows. Firstly, that uh, the uh, individual income tax rate uh, would, kick, would, would increase from 37% to 39.6%. Uh, there's going to be a, in the package, a proposal that creates a new 3% surcharge on, on taxpayers that have adjusted gross income in excess of $5 million. And these new tax rates are effective next year. So uh, to the extent that this legislation does get enacted, and that still remains an if, I, I still believe it's more likely than not that there will be legislation enacted this year that will change the individual tax rate that obviously puts into consideration uh, planning that needs to be done uh, this, this calendar year that um, uh, with having lower rates here in, uh, in 2021, you want to accelerate uh, income if possible into this uh, tax year and conversely, defer any deductions out into 2022 to take advantage of, of those higher tax rates. What's also in this package is a proposal that would increase the, the, the top current rate in capital gains and qualified dividends. And that's gonna move from 20% to 25%. In the Ways and Means Committee package, that is effective on September 14th of 2021. So for all capital gains and dividends that um, uh, occur after uh, September 13th of this year, those rates will move from 20 to 25%. What's also uh, significantly changed here is carried interest. This is something that Congress has looked at extensively over a number of years. And with a Democratic controlled uh, uh, House and Senate that uh, there's likely to be a change here in carried interest. 
And the change that's being proposed right now by the uh, Ways and Means Committee basically eliminates the ability of many holders of carried interest and in investment funds to obtain long-term capital gain treatment. The, 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 the package also has um, a, a proposal that would subject all earnings, this would be both passive and non-passive, uh, from pass-through businesses to the 3.8% net investment income tax. And this again will kick in again, all of these generally speaking would kick in for taxpayers that have uh, income greater than $400,000 for individual filers, singular filers, or in this case, about $500,000 uh, for joint filers. In, in 2017, the, the unified credit for gifts and estates was increased to $10 million. This Ways and Means Committee proposal would end uh, the increase of the unified credit, credit and reverting it back to the $5 million level indexed for inflation. So uh, right now that's about $6 million in, in 2022. So under the Ways and Means Committee proposal, uh, and this would be effective for decedents dying and gifts made after 2021, it re would revert back to the old unified credit of $5 million, again, in index for inflation. The proposal also modifies the estate tax valua valuation rules for transfers of non-business assets. And those assets are not afforded uh, the valuation discount uh, for transfer tax purposes. The, um, the, the couple changes on the IRA side, uh, the proposal prohibits taxpayers from contributing to IRAs once the account balance exceeds $10 million as the end of the, of the prior taxable year. And this proposal would also increase the required minimum distributions, the RMD, if the account balance exceeds $10 million at the end of a tax year. And this increase in the RMD requirements applies to all taxpayers, not just taxpayers have reached, who have reached the magic age of, of 72. Can the next slide, please? So as I mentioned, there's a tremendous uncertainty here, uh, tremendous uncertainty in terms of uh, where this package is gonna go. Uh, it, it, as you all know, I mean, uh, notwithstanding the fact that, that, that the, the president uh, 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 and the House and the, the, the Senate are all controlled by, uh, by the Democrats, it's very slim, if any, margins. I mean, on the House side, uh, uh, Pelosi can, can lose no more than three Democrats. On the Senate side, there can, it, it, zero Democrats can be lost. And the reason being, in, in reconciliation legislation, you, you need a simple majority uh, to, to get legislation enacted. And, uh, and so that's why there's been so much negotiation with Senator Manchin from uh, uh, West Virginia and uh, Senator Sinema from, uh, from Arizona. Uh, both of them are, are, are very centrist in, in their thinking and uh, generally speaking are opposing a lot of the tax rate increases. And so what we heard earlier this week is that uh, the president has met with uh, these two centrists and other leaders on both the House and the Senate side. And what we're hearing right now is that this, this, this $3.5 trillion package has taken a very serious haircut. Uh, the, the president is now talking about a spending package in the neighborhood of, uh, of $2 trillion. And the impact that's gonna have is it's gonna lower the demand on how much revenue needs to be generated from the Ways and Means Committee. And uh, it's also going to have an impact and what's near and dear to my heart and the clients I'm now serving, and that is the impact on, on uh, making the child tax credit permanent. Uh, what appears to be happening right now is that uh, the, the child tax credit being available for all individuals, there's no income eligibility, that will, will likely now only receive a, a, a one-year extension. So I've covered a lot here. I, I'm sorry, I, I've aimed at you with a fire hose. You're sitting there holding the Dixie cup. And, and if anything, I hope I've, I've kind of instilled kind of an interest in what's going on here, because again, I truly believe that on, on a more likely than not basis, that uh, we're going to see uh, significant tax legislation enacted uh, before Thanksgiving that may have an impact on your own personal income tax situation. So let me just stop here and, uh, and open up uh, the floor, so to speak, for uh, your questions, and I'll do my best uh, to answer them. Great, Jim, thank you. So 
you have a number of different ways to be able to, uh, uh, to share your questions with us. Uh, you can do it uh, through the chat feature. Uh, just click on chat and you can begin to type in uh, your question or you could at least um, raise your hand, raise a thumb, let us know if you're interested in uh, speaking. Uh, I still think everybody has the ability to turn off the mute on your microphone, on your computer, but um, Kamani and Carmen, I think uh, one or two questions had already shared previously. Maybe you could um, uh, read one of those off for us. Sure. One of the questions we received is, will this affect directing my required minimum distributions for my IRA as a gift to Catholic Charities? Well, again, the, 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 the rules that, that, that I've talked about here um, would affect taxpayers who um, are in a situation where their IRA balance at the end of the year exceeds $10 million. And, uh, and if, if that does kick in, there is going to be um, an additional required uh, distribution coming out in the form of an RMD. Uh, now, now, what impact that has in terms of, of Catholic Charities, I'm really not, I, I can't comment on because I don't know if that's limited in dollar amount or, 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 or how, that, how that feature works. But again, uh, the, the RMD uh, will be increased, again, for all taxpayers, uh, not, not just those that have uh, reached the age of 72 if their balance uh, exceeds that, that, that $10 million number. And again, as I've mentioned, um, this is just a proposal right now by the Ways and Means Committee, and, and all of this is subject to change uh, once the bill goes through the final review process with uh, the leadership on both the Senate side and the House side. And, uh, and that needs to be done, obviously, before the, the president signed this into law. Deacon Jim, and the follow-up is, when would these changes take effect? Any? Yeah, generally speaking, these changes will take effect next year. Okay. okay. And uh, the only change right now that uh, we may need to worry about is a change in the capital gain rate, which has already been set at, uh, you know, effective uh, September 14th by the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, but outside of that one, I would say, all of these changes kick in in 2022 going forward and uh, only targeted for those uh, making in excess of uh, $400,000 on uh, the single side and four fit for uh, couples filing a joint return. Jim, this is John Chushan. A quick question um, with respect to, I know that we're under the current legislation that's proposed we revert back to the original lifetime of gift tax exemption, right? As opposed right. to under the yeah. 2017 tax laws. Right. Where do you see this going for sort of the more, maybe less widely used, but things like irrevocable life insurance trusts or grantors trusts, those types of things. Do you see them kind of monkeying with those as well? I, I, I do, John. And uh, and again, I've just gone through the, the key uh, proposals here, but... Uh, I mean, this is a, a, um, a $2.2 trillion tax increase package, and there is a lot of nuggets in here, a lot. And, uh, and I know a lot of us uh, thinking, oh my gosh, this is gonna kind of work through the process and who knows if the whole thing will collapse. Uh, but um, uh, there are a, a lot of changes there. I'm not, I'm not a, uh, an individual, I'm, <laughs> I'm a, a recovering corporate tax lawyer. Uh, but uh, John, I would encourage you to talk to your advisors. Uh, okay. There's a lot is in play here, yeah, and okay. uh, yeah. But again, the, the, but again, all of these rules, generally speaking, would not kick in until uh, 2022. And again, I mean, I mean, the, the the president campaigned on on you know going after uh, uh, high income individuals to pay for a, a lot of spending on on the social side. Uh, one, one last point, I think just, you know, I think I commend you and Kevin for setting this up. But I mean, the overarching message here is the things are changing, the winds are moving in a different direction. And for those that have been fortunate and are blessed enough to have these kinds of assets, it's a good time to be thoughtful and think about getting some planning in place before the end of the year. And yes. I would just caution everybody, everybody's very busy. So try to pick up your phone and call your local estate lawyer or accountant. 
you know, three weeks from now is going to be more difficult than it would be if you did it next week. Yeah, yeah, I, that, that's very good counsel, John. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, that's that's been, those have been terrific. Thank you. And I see uh, really, one more question, Kevin. Oh, sure. What is the fate of stepped up basis in the reconciliation bill? And apart from the child tax credit, how will the reconciliation bill affect CCDC clients? Um, well, uh, I, I can't come in on a step up basis as, as yet because I, I don't I don't know uh, wh where this thing will will land. In, in terms of our, our clients, um, the, the the feature that has the the greatest emphasis right now is th this child tax credit. I mean, this has taken more families out of poverty than perhaps any other piece of legislation enacted. And of course, that was just done uh, for 2021. And the hope is that this would be made permanent, but in light of its cost, uh, it will uh, only receive uh, perhaps a, a one or two year extension. But the other provisions there um, that are, are of, of great importance uh, to, our, uh, to our clients is um, the discussion on the education side. Um, a lot of interest in, uh, in universal pre-K, uh, a, a lot of interest in, in having um, community college uh, tuition being paid for. Uh, and so a, a lot of our clients are, 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 are very, very concerned about um, uh, the, the, the educational component that, 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 that's, that, that is part of this, of, of this package. Uh, and so I would say the two most important things to our clients uh, involve um, the, the child tax credit and the impact on, on the educational component. My, my hope always has been that there would also continue to be uh, more economic stimulus checks. Uh, and uh, because we know from a number of the clients we're working with right now that uh, they are still suffering significantly from the impact of the pandemic uh, on their um, on their. On their, on their economic livelihoods. And it's taking a long time for them to get uh, their, their, their feet back on the ground and, and getting uh, back up. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, you know, we, we were also hopeful that there would be an expansion on the, on the earned income tax credit uh, it, 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 as part of this package. Because um, there continues to be a, a lot of lobbying going on, on on the Senate Democrat side. I mean, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of uh, the senators uh, have made commitments, particularly from states like uh, like uh, Connecticut and New York and and uh, in New Jersey, to eliminate uh, the, the 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 salt cap, the state and local uh, tax reduction cap. So there's a lot a lot's in process here, and uh, so uh, uh, my my hope is uh, you know particularly as it relates to the child tax credit and these other spending changes. That um, and, and, and that this, that I, I'm hopeful. My personally hopeful right now that uh, that this legislation will get uh, will get signed into law. Terrific, thank you, Jim. Uh, thanks to all who shared their uh, questions. That really is the idea behind this. We want to provide some food for thought so that you can think about these things. Uh, you know, as Jim said, there's a lot of moving pieces, nothing in stone yet, but still we wanted to be sure that you had general information as, as to what's out there and the potential impacts that it could have on you so that you can have this kind of a thoughtful discussion, you know, with your own tax professionals. So thank you, Jim, for, uh, for pulling together that information on this. Um, so at this time, why don't we go into um, the next part of the discussion, which is going to highlight uh, the Financial Stability Network. Yeah, Kevin, if you could put up the next slide. Sorry. That's okay, Kevin. Operating. Let me try again. Well, while Kevin's doing that, um, 
To the extent that there are any other questions that you wanted to ask about the, the, this tax bill, and we didn't get a time to answer uh, uh, during the webinar here, please, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I, I stay very close uh, with my colleagues at Price Waterhouse. I was in the national office there since 1982, and um, I'd be happy to uh, 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 augment or otherwise give you uh, at least our, the, the, our best thinking on um, the, the, these changes working their way through uh, through Congress. So please uh, feel free to reach out to me. And my, and my uh, contact information is jim.shanahan at cc-dc.org, or certainly Kevin can, can, can refer you to me. Okay, the Financial Stability Network. Um, and uh, I was thinking about, uh, as, as Elizabeth was making her remarks, uh, uh, we are eternally grateful, not only to this group for the funding of the Financial Stability Network, but also to the legal network that, that Elizabeth has been so close to because uh, uh, everything we've done here in the Financial Stability Network has been modeled after uh, the, 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 the legal network. Uh, when I arrived at, at Catholic Charities in, in 2015, I, I have a vivid discussion, a memory of sitting down with Father John one day and say, Father John, I see all these lawyers roaming around and doctors and dentists and other professionals. I said, where, where are the accountants? And uh, he says, oh, Jim, you know, our, our, our clients don't need accountants. Uh, they've, 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 they've got a little money to come for. He said, oh, John, oh, John, I don't know if I agree with that. So in any event, um, we, uh, we, we launched the Financial Stability Network and and um, you know, we're in our, it's at five years right now. And so if you wouldn't mind putting the ne next slide, uh, Kevin. Uh, well, Jim, it's just, it's not cooperating for me. There, okay. So there you go. with this, since this one will work here. Yeah, yeah, let's just go with that. Let's just go with that. Yeah. So um, when I first sat down with, with, with Father John and the executive team, um, I, I, I kind of share with them kind of my thought about the Financial Stability Network. And, and I started with this slide, uh, uh, building self-sufficiency. I, I, I said to, to the team, I said, to me, you know, every, every human being, and this is Catholic Social Teaching 101, every human being has three God-given rights. Uh, one is our, our right to life, and, and that's where, you know, Catholic Charities has been playing in this space from the beginning, and that is to make sure that everyone has their, has whatever it takes to, to, to maintain a healthy life from food and shelter and clothing to medical to dental. Uh, and, uh, and that's been the primary space that, that uh, the agency has played in. The, the, the second leg of this three-legged stool is a right to education. And, and we live in a country that has free education through high school and perhaps now free education through, through community college. The, the third leg is uh, every human being has a God-given right to work. And from that job, uh, the earnings from that job to pay for one's living expenses and to set money aside for a financial goal. And it was really kind of the financial stability leg of this three-legged stool that I got permission from uh, Father John and his executive team five years ago to launch this. So the, ne the, ne the next slide, Kevin. So this is, this is the framework. Uh, and we don't have a lot of time right now to go through it, but this is the framework that we are walking through right now to help our clients achieve uh, financial stability. And uh, we, we, we accompany our, our, our clients. Uh, we, we oftentimes use uh, Pope Francis's term, the, the art of accompaniment. And uh, we are blessed with uh, 200 plus uh, mentors who actually walk our clients through this, this, this three-step uh, framework. It starts with meeting our clients where they are and, and may the clients we meet actually doing their tax returns and, and helping them generate uh, the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit. Um, many clients come to us because they're, they're having problems with their credit score or they're, they're having problems resolving a, a student debt. Uh, many of them are coming to us, they're, they're just, they need help just 
finding ways to, to decrease their expenses, accessing public benefits. They, 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 I mean, much of what we do in VITA is accessing public benefits. It's through the tax system, as strange as it sounds, that that's where we're uh, generating uh, refundable credits and whether it's a child tax credit, the earned income tax credit. Um, we have uh, here in DC, a DC renter's credit. Um, and uh, we also help our clients. We, 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 we refer to a lot of clients from our employment assistance program where individuals are, are getting a new job and we're just helping them uh, uh, become better employed, so to speak. From step one, we move to step two, and this is where we help them actually build assets, and we do that through budgeting. Uh, a number of our financial coaches are, are expert at, at, at helping our clients budgeting. Uh, uh, earlier today, I, I, I finished a, a Zoom call with an employee of Catholic Charities uh, who really, really needs help. She was referred to me by Father John in just kind of basic budgeting, and she admitted on this call that this is a life skill that that was not that was not taught to her, and um, and so budgeting is a component. Uh, and then, and then finally, we you know, we move into asset protection and insurance, and and the, and the idea here is, and this could take um, a, a, a year or so uh, of of of, uh, of planning, maybe two years. Uh, but, our, but our hope is to help our clients achieve financial stability and whether that's home ownership or, or being able to retire or having money set aside uh, for emergency savings account or uh, you want to start, start a small business or buying a car or paying for college. And, and throughout this, that, that, that arrow on the bottom is um, the, um, you know, the focus on, uh, on, on our financial education program. So embedded in the financial stability network, our, our, our three lines of service. Uh, one is our, our financial uh, uh, education program. Our second is our mentoring program. And, and third is our tax program. Uh, Kevin, the next slide, please. So this is a picture of five years ago. I thought Father John was gonna be with us today, but uh, five years ago, we were all gathered, five hard ups were gathered at Gonzaga. And uh, this is where we launched the Financial Stability Network. So in a little over a week, we celebrate our, our, our five-year anniversary. Standing between me and Father John is Michelle Singletary. She was our, our keynote speaker and, uh, and that really helped us get launched. Uh, so ne the next slide, um, yeah. So again, real quickly, um, just to give you some data points, uh, we've had over the past five years, uh, 225 uh, mentees uh, have entered the program and uh, they've been supported by over 200 uh, trained mentors that we've recruited. Um, since our very first tax season, going back to 2017, we've completed uh, over 1,500 tax returns, uh, generating on average $1,000 of refund per client. Uh, we have been uh, helping everyone uh, that's a so-called non-filer. These include our clients and our shelters. These include our clients that we meet through the Welcome Home Reentry Program, obtain their, their economic stimulus checks. The, the, the next slide there is uh, our financial education program. We have been offering um, uh, classes. We've, uh, for an example, we have a monthly uh, Zoom class uh, for uh, uh, employees of Catholic Charities. So we've delivered 40 workshops over the last couple of years and had a number of wonderful guest speakers. And then finally, in terms of our dreams of the future, uh, a number of dreams that we have. Uh, one is uh, to address uh, the economic injustice that we've experienced here uh, to form a, an economic justice institute. Uh, we're in the process of using Google Classroom to create an FSN university to offer diplomas to our mentees. Um, we're also hoping this year to launch a social enterprise program. Um, we are um, hoping to uh, identify a handful of uh, employers uh, who would like to create a financial wellness program in, in their workplace. And then and the finally, I know one of Father John's dreams is to, is to form the Father John Credit Union. And, and so many of our clients have nowhere to turn. They have uh, very poor credit scores and uh, are forced to go to payday lenders. And wouldn't it be wonderful for us to have a credit union where we could uh, provide them short-term loans and, uh, and also bring them into our, uh, our, our, our mentoring program. So again, covered a lot there. And uh, I know you've got some other things you wanna cover here uh, in the program, Kevin, but let me just stop to see if there's any, any questions folks may have about the Financial Stability Network. Jim, this is John, just two, two questions. One is on an annual basis, what is, the, what is the outlay, financial outlay for Catholic Charities to run this program a year? 
Well, that's a very good question, John. We have one employee. His name is Emmanuel Duga. Uh, he's been two years out of college, so he's an entry-level uh, staff person. And uh, everyone else is a volunteer. I mean, everyone else is a volunteer. Uh, I mean, my, 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 my day job is to uh, lead the, the parish outreach program. And so I kind of monitor this from the side at night. But this is, this is it just, I mean, again, it's, it just illustrates the power uh, but like we have in the legal network, we've got, you know, Jim Bishop and a few other uh, employees, but, but look at what we've created there. And we're trying to do the same thing here is to have, you know, a little bit of a staff there, but then it all comes from all these volunteer CPAs and certified financial planners and tax lawyers that work and they love working in this kind of environment. Right. Uh, That's and impressive. So, yeah. And then the second question, which just in terms of, I, sh I shudder to even ask this question, but in terms of the Father John Credit Union, is there any sort of order of magnitude of what the target of that would be initially? I mean, John, it's a, it's a dream right now, John, but 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 it, I was inspired uh, two or three years ago, there was a, uh, an article in, in the post style section about a Methodist church in somewhere in Virginia forming a, a credit union. I say, God, we got to do something like that because um, so many of our clients you know, face it, if you're, if you're um, living in St. Mary's County and your job is up here, you know, working on a construction site, the car breaks down, there's no public transportation. The only way you can get there to fix the car, if it's broken down, is to find $500 and they really can't find the $500. So that forces them into a debt trap, sometimes called the death trap by, by, by turning to a payday lender or whoever's out there loaning this money. But the idea would be to have this available for those uh, individuals who've been, you know, referred to us by, you know, a parish, a pastor, says, listen, this is Joe. I know Joe's a good guy. He may have a bad credit score, but, uh, you know, can you help him out? And then, um, and so that's, that's kind of dream there, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll start small and, 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 and then surely build it up. Cause that's, that's the most critical need. So many of our clients need, John, is that, that, that emergency assistance um, uh, to, to help them out of a, a, a tough situation like that. Thank you. Couple things, Deacon Jim. Someone said happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Um, how does someone become a mentor or coach? Holy, they, they, they give me a call. Uh, we, uh, we have a very active volunteer engagement office. I mean, I'll just give a shout out to Maggie O'Neill who leads that office. Uh, uh, she, she's recruited through the fall campaign here uh, 15 uh, newly minted uh, 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 mentors, and uh, we'll be training them up on, on uh, November the 11th. Uh, but uh, please reach out to me. Uh, we have uh, a very robust uh, uh, onboarding uh, that comes through uh, our volunteer engagement office. And then, and then we take them into our training program to train them up to be a mentor or we're starting our training in uh, in January for all of our tax preparers, and uh, we're always looking for instructors to teach classrooms. And so, please, uh, it's a just a a wonderful volunteer opportunity. So, do you think your greatest need right now would be the instructors, or is there something else that? My my, my greatest need right now, to truth be told, are bilingual mentors. Uh, I would say half of the community that we serve uh, are Spanish speaking. And I just wish we had more uh, bilingual mentors and, um, uh, and instructors. The good news is the IRS is um, they're, they're, they've got a service called OPI, over the phone interpreters. And so we do have a service where an English speaking uh, tax preparer can meet with um, a, a Spanish speaker or French speaking uh, uh, a taxpayer and get their tax returns done. So it's really in the instruction arena as well as the mentor arena. But for English speaking, I would say our, our highest need is, is on the mentor side. Uh, just a lot of, a, a lot of needs there. That's great. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, here's Deacon Jim's information. I can send it out uh, to all of you afterward in an email so you don't have to worry about finding a piece of paper and a pen and trying to write the info down <laughs> this very minute. So, uh, but Jim, thank you so much. For well, thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin, for having me. I enjoyed, I enjoyed uh, being with you all. 
No, and, and enjoyed having you. Uh, we loved having the opportunity to highlight one of the, uh, the many different programs um, and at the same time uh, tap into your, uh, your tax expertise, so to speak, to give everybody a heads up as to, well, you know, you should put this on your radar and think about talking about this with your, uh, with your accountants. Uh, so that's terrific. So thank you for that. Um, the one thing that I did want to do before um, we close up here, uh, thank you all for taking the time to, uh, to join us today. Uh, we will make this recording available so that you can view it at a later date. If there's anything that you would like to go back to, I'll have an email that will probably go out uh, sometime early next week with a link so that you can uh, look at this. But this is um, part of the package that uh, comes from the Good Samaritan, <coughs> excuse me, the Good Samaritan Society. Those are individuals who have named Catholic charities in their estate plans. They're making a deferred gift, a gift in the future, whether it's um, you know a gift through their will, whether it's a beneficiary designation, uh, whether it's some kind of a, uh, a life income gift. Um, those individuals who have taken the time to make a commitment to Catholic Charities, uh, we're so very grateful uh, and appreciative, and that's why uh, we've taken the time to put together the Good Samaritan Society uh, to honor you and to thank you. So if there's anyone who would like to uh, learn a little bit more about that, certainly you can reach out to me or you can look on the website um, under different ways to give and you can learn a little bit more about uh, the Good Samaritan Society, as well as the uh, many different ways that one could uh, make an estate gift, a future gift, to support Catholic charities. Uh, that's something that's very important to the future of Catholic charities as we look uh, to be able to plan for its future finances. Yes, uh, we do a great job through our annual giving programs, uh, what we were able to raise uh, through this recent campaign but we're always looking forward to be able to have a regular stream of the income to be able to help Catholic Charities and the agency maintain all of those programs uh, and keep them in operation so that we can do what we do best, which is uh, to help those in need. So once again, thank you all for joining us. Jim, thank you again for speaking. Elizabeth, thank you for uh, sharing uh, Father John's info, as well as uh, you know, contributing the uh, board of director perspective. Um, check us out at catholiccharitiesdc.org if you're interested in more information. And um, for the Good Samaritan Society members, we're looking to have our annual in-person mass and brunch. We're uh, targeting the spring, whether it's going to be April or May, uh, but keep that on your radar things hopefully will be better and we will be able to uh, see each other all in the same room instead of sitting in front of a, uh, a video screen to do that. Thank you again for your interest. Thank you again for all that you do for Catholic Charities. Have yourself a great rest of your day. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Thanks, Thank you. Good, good job.